The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. The last forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Though the world Falls around me I rest And know That He has found me Christ the rock Is my foundation I will trust in Him I will trust in Him Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for preaching all salvation through one Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In uh, looking over the various Pastor Yeshua podcasts thus far, it occurs to me that I've largely looked at the Bible peripherally, and although it has always been my intention to look at the Bible directly, I've somewhat been preoccupied into now, but I think the time has come where we should begin to, as time permits, look at the Bible per se. So, in this series of episodes, my endeavor is to conduct a proper hermeneutical an exegetical, verse-by-verse study of the various books of the Bible. In this case, I landed in 1 Thessalonians, which is where I intend to start, and our goal is to understand not only the details of what was going on at the time when it was written, but uh, more importantly, to understand what it is saying to God's elect in the church today. As a general rule, whenever we study God's Word, it is ultimately true that in every case we can agree with 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, that God's Word, the Bible, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. This is because our presuppositional approach And our biblical worldview as God's saints is that God is the ultimate authority for meaning, morals, truth, beauty, significance, and reality. Further, our assumption is that God has chosen to reveal himself and his attributes, his relationship to man, his plan of creation, fall, redemption, restoration, and glorification via his Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh, who breathes God's revelation into his word, the Bible. Let's pray. 
Father, I pray that as we open your word in the episodes to follow, that your Holy Spirit would soften our hearts, open our minds, and help us to receive the revelation of your word, which divides truth and error, life and death. Let us now receive your word with eagerness, thanksgiving, and discernment, and with a proper Berean attitude of study. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you're sitting there and you have the ability, join me in opening your copy of God's Word for an introduction into Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians. As stated, by summary, the following and all of its episodes is an outline study of First Thessalonians using proper hermeneutical and exegetical principles in keeping with the spirit of a Berean attitude with the Reformation whose principal ideal was sola scriptura, i.e. the scriptures are the sole infallible rule of faith and practice. To that extent, to God be the glory. Let's start with some uh, general principles. Now, as stated before, and you can, uh, if you like, look at this in the introductory episode to questions about contradictions. We talked about hermeneutics. And with hermeneutics, as with every other endeavor and study regarding the Bible, we always want to use known, common, and accepted rules regarding the proper interpretation of the Bible, as with any other piece of literature. The rules include, but are not limited to, the proper consideration and application of languages, context, grammar, culture, audience, author, historical setting, and genre. Next we have exegesis. I have a $25 word which basically, by every definition, is an interpretation and reading of scripture should at all times be guided and bent to the true intent of the author and of the text in question and ultimately to God who inspires them within the framework and constraints of a valid hermeneutic principle which we just mentioned. And we must be diligent to avoid the temptation to influence or superimpose our own bias and opinion upon the text and then attempt to conform this and other texts to those preconceptions, which would be eisegesis. Having given a brief summary, let's look at a background introduction to the first book of Thessalonians. To begin with, Thessalonica, which is where the Thessalonian church was eventually founded, is a town in Greece on the northwest coast of the Gulf of the Aegean Sea. The town was founded around 315 BC by General Cassander of Macedon on or near the site of the ancient town of Therma. Cassander of Macedon named the new city after his wife Thessalonike, a half-sister of Alexander the Great. Now, Thessalonica had a strategic Macedonian location on the Ignatian Way with a key seaport trade route connecting Rome with the eastern provinces and an excellent natural harbor which attracted a very robust trade climate. Under the Roman Empire, Thessalonica became the capital city of the Roman province of Macedonia around 146 B.C., for the most part, Thessalonica was a wealthy city and had a Roman, Greek, and Jewish population. After 42 BC, Thessalonica enjoyed liberty as a free city with a large population. Thessalonica was religiously pluralistic. For example, Thessalonians worshipped a plethora of gods such as the city's patron god Cabrius along with the likes of Dionysus Aphrodite, Zeus, and Asclepius, the god of medicine and physicians. 
Macedonia, like the much of the Roman Empire, was a region of strong emperor worship, where Caesar was also considered to be divine and was to be worshipped. In short, most everyone in Thessalonica was either an idol worshiper or an emperor worshiper before Paul and his companions arrived there to proclaim the gospel of Christ. There's very little doubt that First and Second Thessalonians was written by Paul on his second journey in 52 AD while visiting Corinth with Timothy and Silas, which can be found in Acts chapter 17. So as to familiarize ourselves more with the uh, background of the founding of the Thessalonian church, let's digress shortly to Acts 17. If you're already in Thessalonians, just turn backwards to uh, the book of Acts and into chapter 17, starting with verse 1. Here, the author, Luke, who was the same person who wrote the Gospel of Luke, says, now, when they, that being Paul, Timothy, and Silas, had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. In verse 2, And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. Verse 3, opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Now, what Paul is doing here, basically, as was his habit, is going into Jewish synagogues who are reading from the Torah and or the prophets and or the writings and he was using basically a technique of apologetics. In other words, what he was doing was he was looking at the various prophets, the Psalms, and other things which had to do with prophecy regarding the Messiah. And he took those various prophecies and showed how they connected in detail to the person and to the history and to the life of Jesus of Nazareth and how he fulfilled those things. As a result of Paul's apologetics, in verse 4 we read, And some of them believed, and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of the chief women not a few. By summary, we find uh, looking uh, throughout Acts and other places that the convert believers included Aristarchus, and Segundus, and possibly Gaius, as we see in Acts chapter 19, verse 29, whom we later afterward find accompanying Paul to Asia at the close of his third missionary journey, found in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. Aristarchus is later mentioned as a fellow prisoner in both Colossians chapter 4, verse 10, and Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. Continuing, verse 5, But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. Now what we learn here is that Jason, who is believed to be a more wealthy businessman and Thessalonica, who gave lodging and accommodation to Paul and his companions because Jason was one who believed in Paul's message. The wealth is inferred due to verse 9, where Jason provides bail ultimately for uh, Paul and his companions who are arrested. Additionally, many believe that Jason is the same one mentioned by Paul in Romans chapter 16, verse 21, where it says, quote, Timothy, my fellow worker, greets you, and so do Lucius, Jason, and Sosipater, my kinsmen, unquote. Moving on to verse 6, we read, And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These have turned the world upside down, and are come hither also. 
So basically, what happens is that the Jews in the synagogue and in other places who heard Paul's message were very upset due to the fact that Paul and his companions were claiming that Jesus of Nazareth was in fact the Messiah, when in fact these Jews believed that he was not the Messiah because they had their own agenda. And they were so upset that they found Paul and his companions who were lodging with Jason and basically assaulted the house. In other words, they broke in an attempt to find Paul and all of his companions and to either stone them or to take them to prison, whatever they could uh, manage to do. Fortunately, they didn't find Paul and his companions, but they did find Jason, who was ultimately taken and forced to provide bail in order to assure the Jews that he, Paul, and his companions would return and ostensibly face trial. We actually get an insight into possibly what they were thinking and what they were going to charge him with in verse 7 where it says, Whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. So in other words, what they were looks like they were going to do is they were going to charge Jason with harboring and conspiring to assist Paul and his companions who they were going to charge with sedition by them claiming that Jesus was a king and trying to undermine Caesar who was considered to be not only the king but also a god. So in other words they would be looking at a charge of treason Verse 8, and they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So in other words, the Jews made a lot of trouble with the rulers of the city and other people there with all of these allegations. They were pitting one against the other. Verse 9, and when they had taken security, i.e. Baal of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Now, they don't make mention who the other is, but apparently there was one other, whether it was one of Paul's companions or whether it was somebody else who was a believer who was living with Jason, a family member, or somebody else. In any case, they let Jason and the other go. In verse 10, And the brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. So apparently, Paul and Silas were somewhere in the city, hiding, trying to keep clear of the Jews who were seeking them out and probably wanted to put them to death, ultimately. And people who were believers, i.e. brethren, located Paul and Silas and, under cover of night, secreted them out of Thessalonica unto Berea, which was a neighboring town, where immediately Paul and Silas go into the synagogue there to continue was what was their habit. Verse 11, These were more noble than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. So in other words, having gone into the synagogue of the Jews in Berea, what they found there was a group of Orthodox Jews who received the message that Paul had given there, which was the same that he had given at Thessalonica. And their attitude was markedly different in Paul's estimation. Rather than seeking Paul and Silas out and trying to kill him as they had done in Thessalonica, the Jews here are said to have had a readiness of mind it is almost as if Paul is saying that God had already plowed the minds and the souls and the spirit of the Jews there to receive the seed of the gospel which Paul was going to plant. They had this readiness of mind. So much so that when Paul brought to light these Old Testament prophecies regarding the Messiah, and match them up with Jesus of Nazareth and what he had done in his life and ministry, 
that they went back to the Old Testament and the various scrolls, and they searched the scriptures uh, to see whether what Paul was saying was in fact true or whether he was kind of fudging it or perhaps even lying about it. And they did this daily as Paul brought them this apologetic presentation to see if those things were true. The result we find in verse 12, Therefore, many of them, i.e. the Jews, believed also of honorable women, which were Greeks, and of men, not a few. In other words, there was a lot. There was very many people there, both of the Jews, women, uh, Greeks, both male, male and female, who believed and had the same mindset of what later became the mindset of the Berean, the one who searches the scriptures daily to see whether or not what is being taught, what is being preached, is actually biblical or not. Verse 13, But when the Jews of Thessalonica had knowledge that the word of God was preached of Paul at Berea, they came there thither also and stirred up the people. So in other words, however long Paul and Silas had been in Berea preaching the gospel and winning converts there to Christ, the fact that they were doing that, the news that they were doing that, reached the same group of Jews in Thessalonica who had sought out Paul and Silas and Timothy and who had broken into Jason's home and who had uh, taken bail of Jason and were searching for Paul in order to uh, prosecute him. They find out that he's in Berea. And so what do they do? They get so stirred up that they actually start searching for Paul. They go to Berea. Uh, we don't know how many people, but it sounds like there's more than one. There's certainly enough to to cause concern. And when they get there, they stir up the people. In other words, they, they start probably telling these people what happened in Thessalonica according to their story and trying to uh, uh, portray Paul and Silas as these uh, interlopers who are trying to uh, cause sedition and treason and undermine... Uh, the authority of Rome, and so forth. So this is what's going on. So as we turn to 1 Thessalonians and open up the epistle, understand that this is going to be the uh, atmosphere. This is going to be the reception that Paul and Silas get that we don't necessarily get in detail via 1 Thessalonians, but it is the historical account, in fact, of what did happen. So we need to understand that. So here in 1 Thessalonians, we go from the founding of the church, which is detailed in Acts, to the letter itself, 1 Thessalonians, which is written after Paul, Silas, and Timothy leave Thessalonica and travel to Berea, then to Athens, and then later to Corinth, which is 400 miles from Thessalonica. And it is at this point in Corinth where Paul then writes first and then later second Thessalonians the same year or a year later having left Thessalonica. Now, from the Thessalonian letter itself, we learn that since Paul had founded the church, but was now gone away, he was starting to hear troubling news which caused him to write the first and the second letter, which bear the name of Thessalonians, to address the issues that were going on there. For example, he had heard that the Thessalonian church believers were being persecuted. Property was being seized. Workers were stopped from practicing their trades as in the case of Jason. Those who found a new faith were shunned by their families. Some were insulted. Some were beaten. Some were actually put to death. They were experiencing suffering of the worst kind. Thus, Paul writes a letter to the church to encourage them. 
And with this in mind, in our next episode, we will open 1 Thessalonians to chapter 1 to study what Paul wrote there. For the time being, this concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Trust in